morning, Vietnam! <laughs> <laughs> Feels that way sometimes. Right, right? I know. I want to feel like we're in a war zone sometimes. So, I'm Ian. I'm the Education and Outreach Manager here at the Sternberg Museum. I am along with Dr. Reese Barrick, who is our museum director. And today we bring you a live cast direct from the dome to your home. I had a lot of coffee this morning. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk today about Ice Age stuff. Ice Age. Which generally means mammals. Big mammals and big mammals. And, and you know, small mammals that got big. They're mammoth, you might say. <laughs> wow. Ooh. Ooh. Dad jokes. We've got them. to the best we've, of us. We've got them. We've got them all day. <laughs> You're not supposed to crack up the camera, girl. <laughs> oh, we are on today. So, where shall we start? The topic. What is the What is the main thing about Ice Age mammals? What is the topic? We have a topic. Sure. Why not? Let's make one up. Oh, come on. We're, yeah, I was gonna say that this is so fluid. Well, things things in the Ice Age are things in the Ice Age are ginormous. They're ginormous. They're or, big. In Iowa, we call them great big huge. Great big huge. I like ginormous. <laughs> and it just sounds intense to me. Ginormous! But the idea is, is, you know, we think of Ice Age mammals, we think of things that are really large, like mammoths. Um, which is over here. Oh, look at that. We've got a mammoth. Mighty mammoth. It's big. It's big. It's big. And we usually think of mammoths like woolly mammoths. Um, oh, there we go. Hey, wow. Where did that come from? We have more light. Let there be light. <laughs> Please. We think of woolly mammoths, but there's not just woolly mammoths. There's lots of different kinds of, of elephant type animals in the Ice Age. Uh, what we have right behind Ian now is a Colombian mammoth. And the Colombian mammoths, one of the more significant ways that you can tell that they're different from a woolly mammoth is, guess what? They're not woolly? They're not woolly. <laughs> How can you tell though? This thing's naked. It's hard to tell with these things. Um, but there have been, actually, this is a really interesting character. While we did have mammoths and, what else did we have besides mammoths? Mastodons. Mastodons, which are another elephant type characters that were all over the US during the Pleistocene or the Ice Age. Um, but, you know, they died out about 10,000 years ago, which is not all that long ago. But it was the same time, lots of big things. I mean, if you think about it, what, 10,000 years ago, um, do you, I thought the last one died out when the earliest pyramids were being constructed. Is that true? Or did they die out earlier than that? 4,000. It's 4,000 years ago. So the last of the mammoths died out 4,000 years ago. That's in the world, though. In the world. Right. But not necessarily North America. But not necessarily North America. Right. We're full of useless facts here. <laughs> Maybe they're useful. I don't know. You know, if you're sitting around a card table in our quarantine world, you can throw out these useless facts. <laughs> Did you know? All right. Anyways, proceed. <laughs> but there, there, there's lots of, there's, you know, lots of, uh, of reasons why potentially they went extinct. One of them is there was a changing climate by quite a bit of things that happened. There was also some evidence of some, oh, people, impacts of, of things from outer space. And there was lots of people. People got over to not them. aliens, not aliens. It's not aliens. <laughs> <laughs> um, but people got to the, got to North America at the very latest 13,000 years ago. There's evidence now that it might go back as far as even 30,000 years ago. But um, people get to a place where there's, they've not been before, so animals don't even know to really be afraid of them. And they can be, you know, there's a lot of meat on one of these things. Have you ever looked at a person? People are scary. If I was an animal, I'd be terrified of a people, I mean, of a person. Because like, look at our heads, our heads are weird bobbly things. I know, but, but the thing is, that's a big thing. That is a big thing. And there's one thing that's fascinating about giant elephants uh, like mammoths. I was in South Africa once and I was traveling around by myself and I got out because I saw this herd of elephants off in the distance about eh, 200 yards, like maybe two football fields away. 
and I got out of the car with my camera and I walked towards the elephants, maybe about 10, 15, 20 yards towards them so I could get a good picture. And the lead male elephant, the big bull elephant, took two steps towards my direction, flared the ears out, and I, it was the scariest moment of my life. I was like, sprinted back to the car, jumped in, was like breathing heavy, going, <gasps> and it gave me a whole new appreciation for the, the natives in that area that just walk around in front of the elephants, you know, carry it. And I'm like, are you kidding me? That's, that's scary. Yeah, yeah. So the idea of even people in the ice age coming around and deciding to hunt an elephant, that, that's got... That's a much cooler elephant experience than the one I've had. <laughs> the only elephant experience I ever had was at the Shriners Circus. And I, I, I can't remember what I was doing behind the scenes, but I was behind the scenes. Number one, they had a, a panther that you could pet. And I don't know, something made the panther angry, so it sprayed. So that was already kind of a damper on my experience. And then, yeah, that, I got to go see an elephant. I was really excited about the elephants because, well, they're elephants. Um, but this elephant must not have been feeling well because it was very gassy. Ah. And I did not know that elephants could be that gassy. So well, there's a question from uh, Candy. How many mammoths have you guys found? Hi, Candy. You found a lot of mammoths. They're actually fairly common. They are fairly common. Uh, I know... Yeah, I don't know the exact amount in our own collections, but we've got several. We've got multiple mammoths in our collections. The interesting story about this particular mammoth is, you know, while there's, there's thousands of mammoths, parts of mammoths in the, that have been found in museums around the country, very, very few are complete, where you have pretty much the whole mammoth. This mammoth actually came from Utah, and this is a cast of it. The actual bones are in a museum in Utah, which is a museum I used to be the director of 10 years ago. And we actually have this whole skeleton in that particular museum. And it's this is there's only two toe bones and two tips of the tail bones that were missing. Otherwise, it was a complete mammoth. So this is a copy or a cast of a, of a complete mammoth. And it's really fascinating because Mammoths are cool because they live so recently that a lot of them get buried and this particular one had still stomach contents that were preserved. Like there were needles of the things it was eating. It lived up in the, actually in the mountains in Utah at the time. And so there were preserved stomach contents that were kept in a freezer <laughs> in the museum. Um, and the bones still had enough organic material in them that they would expand and contract as the humidity went up and down in the museum. So you had to keep very constant humidity. You had to stay in a special room, or otherwise it would splinter and fall apart into a bazillion pieces, which would be bad. But because it was such a complete uh, mammoth, there were copies made and sold to different museums around the world so that they could put up a complete mammoth that wasn't a composite of bones from a bunch of different individuals, but one actual complete mammoth, which this is. So this is a very, very cool, interesting animal. And it's another kind of fun experience. When I moved here to an interview for the job here, I saw this mammoth and I said, hey, I know this mammoth. I know you quite well. What is uh, his name? <laughs> oh, did he have a name? He didn't have a name. Oh. But he did, interestingly enough, there were some, uh, prehistoric tools that were found very close to the vicinity, suggesting that there may have been some human uh, either cause of death or carving up of this individual when it died. And this is about 13,000, eh, 12,000 years ago, I think is when it was dated. So did, did humans use the bones in North America to make shelter or is that in Europe? That's the, it's a, another really cool one. They actually used them not in North America, but they were used in um, Siberia area to make, you know, if you look at read the Mammoth Hunter books where they use the bones to build shelters, that's something that happened. I know they just recently un un mm -hmm. uncovered a settlement that was constructed of mammoth bones. And that, that was at a place where there was literally no trees, they had nothing else to build from. 
Um, so yeah, it's a, they're very, very potentially useful things. Well, I come up on the shallow end when it comes to paleoanthropology. <laughs> uh, I took a couple of anthropology classes and decided people scare me, so I chose to go further back. So my knowledge is a little less than perfect. One of the things, oh, that, that, that in, in Utah, the prehistoric museum was half archaeology, and we had lots of things with atlatls, which are the really long spears with the little So let's step thing. back for a second. What is the difference between archaeology and Ooh. paleontology? What is the difference? Because, you know, whenever somebody finds out that I, I know paleontology, that I've studied paleontology, and work in a museum that deals with paleontology. They always want to talk to me about tools and arrowheads and, and Indian artifacts that, that their grandfather has found. And I'm like, well, that's, that's great. So archaeology involves what? People. Paleontology involves what? Animals. <laughs> Not people. Not peoples. <laughs> so, everything else. Yes. Everything else. Well, and then you run into what I just said, paleoanthropology. What oh, does that mean? That's even scarier, because then we're talking about ancient peoples. Ancient people and their interaction, in some cases, with fossils. So it gets confusing. So there's, there's, there's a little time period where we have fossil animals and we have ancient peoples interacting, and we there's a convergence of the archaeology, which is this basically study of artifacts of people in the ancient past, versus paleontology, which is strictly fossil animals and the study of earth history and animals and life through time. So there's a little interaction there because humans have only been around for the last very short period of time. So we lost our lights. We lost our lights. Oh well. We're going dark. You know, I will, I will have to admit that one of the coolest classes I ever took in my college career was a lithic technology course where we learned to kind of live and adapt to a certain area using just what we could find around us. And we kind of, the, the class broke into two different clans and we could decide whether we were going to share or steal things from one another and borrow ideas. It was really cool. It was one of the coolest courses I ever took. Speaking of cool, cool, it was very cool in the Ice Age. Is that why they call it the Ice Age? <laughs> but how cool was it, really, like, say, in Kansas? Well, you know, we had Ice Ages were basically the buildup of huge ice sheets, both in Antarctica and also in the uh, northern part of the northern hemisphere, the Arctic. And those ice sheets would spread all the way down, basically covering all of Canada and coming down and covering certain parts of North America. And there's even uh, one of them is called the Kansan Ice Age, where the Ice Age sheets actually got into northeastern Kansas. Crazy. Which meant everything both, you know, south of the ice sheet was kind of like Siberian northern tundra, where it was just dry grasslands. Um, I always imagine it kind of being the vacation spot of the Ice Age, you know. That's your that's your destination. <laughs> Lots of freshwater rivers, right, coming from the, the glaciers. Exactly. Um, good vegetation if you're a plant eater. For part of the year. For part of the year. <laughs> good good food source if you're not a plant eater. Exactly. So Some of these carnivores that maybe we'll look at later. Is there a question? We have a couple questions. Oh, Ooh, good. Actually, I love questions. Um, first question from Noel. How old are mammoths? When, well, Jake, how old are mammoths? Uh, I think it's about 1.2 million to approximately 4,000 years ago. Repeat that. 1.2 million to about 4,000 years ago was when they were ranged. And, you know, there's, there's more elephant-like animals out there than just the mammoths. We call them, what, pro, proboscidians? Mm -hmm. So what a proboscis is, is a long trunk snooty thing. That's the scientific definition. So we call that a proboscis. Proboscis. They were all, Pro -pro they were all very snooty. Yes. They were very snooty. Um, very, very Dr. Susie, if you will. Mm -hmm. I think. You know. So there were there were a lot of different elephant-like critters running around out there, and 
I, I think we could agree that one, of, I think one of the coolest ones is something called an Ambilodon, which is a shovel tusk. Yes, they're very cool. And what they did was they were root eaters. So they would use their, instead of having big tusks from their, their top of their jaw, their tusks came out from their yeah, come out bottom, sort of their bottom jaw. jaw. And so they'd be able to sort of shovel up their their food source, which is really kind of a neat That's adaptation. That's a great segue to another question okay. we have. Uh, Jason H7 wants to know Hi, Jason. how how big uh, the tusks are on a mammoth. And I guess I would, to... I would, if I were to guess, I would say twelve feet long. If we were to straighten it out, is that for the largest ones would be about that? Yep. Yeah. So they're they're not small in the mammoths. They're pretty big. Um, we have another question from Candy. Um, what kind of mammoths does Nebraska have? Nebraska, interestingly enough, has three different mammoths. They have the woolly mammoth, the Columbian mammoth, which is represented here, and the imperial mammoth. And as a matter of fact, all three of those mammoths are the state fossils of Nebraska. So they had three different mammoths in Nebraska. <laughs> And our uh, state fossils are still better. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have a question from Ashley. Uh, Ian and Reese, how long have you both been at the Sternberg? I've been here 10 years. And I've been here 10 and a half years. Right. <laughs> so it, it, it's, been, it's been quite a while. I got here in August of 2009. I just stumbled in the door in 2010 and just never left. <laughs> They couldn't get rid of me, even if they tried. Ellie asks, how tall is the mammoth? Ooh, good question. You guys want to take a shot at it? Probably. They're mammoths! Go, go stand in front of them. Okay. Take a look. okay, so I'm about six feet tall. Can I stand on this thing? Yep, yeah. all right. Carefully. Yep. Carefully. You're good. All right. So I stand about six feet tall. Whoa. So six feet tall. This and is me for scale at six feet, and I don't quite make well, it. Not quite half. Are you at least you're about halfway, a little more than halfway. Halfway. So we're yeah, talking probably the, twelve feet tall at the shoulder. Eleven or twelve feet at the shoulder. So that's that's a pretty large, pretty large one. And this mammoth actually is a very old mammoth. One of the cool things about it is if Ian looks underneath into his into the vertebra right under the back of the hips there look up look up yep. point you can see the vertebra there are all kind of interestingly sort of messed up and all oh yeah i can see that it's all kind of there's evidence that of all those vertebra that there was lots of arthritis so this was an old one this was a very old uh female Let me see if i can Take the camera here. Hi. All right. So we're going to try to, I'm not so great at this. There we go. So this is what we're talking about. If you look closely, you can see that there's a lot of, oh, sorry, a lot of fusion on that vertebra. And there's a lot of bumpy, sort of lumpy stuff happening towards the back that sort of make it fuse together. Sorry, I'm a terrible camera person. But hopefully that gives you an idea of what we're talking about. I'm going to give this back to Rachel because she is the professional. And uh, uh, hi, Rachel. That's that's what's on the other side of our camera all the time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we can't tell things about this particular individual. It was a female, and it was she was very old. So that's that's kind of a fun, cool thing. The other interesting thing about this particular individual, it was found actually when they were digging to build a dam, uh, to dam up a river to make a big reservoir for water in Utah. And as they were digging, they hit these bones and it was construction timeline. So it was sort of a very muddy area and they were given like a week to get all the bones out because they were going to put a dam in. And so they had tons of volunteers. This was in 1988, as a matter of fact. And so it wasn't, you know, your typical, very slow, methodical excavation. 
that paleontologists like to do normally. It was, you're told to get these bones out or they're going to get crunched and buried in a new dam. So all these bones had to be rapidly excavated um, and put into the museum. So it was really actually kind of a monumental feat and miracle to get all the bones out in as good a shape as they're in uh, and to get an actual complete uh, mammoth in a very short amount of time. I have seen some mammoths that were excavated in a hurry that didn't turn out so well. Uh, the case I'm thinking of, it must have been a torrential rain and they were trying to trying to get that thing dug up as quickly as possible and put it in jackets and get it back to the museum. The problem is, is once it got back to the museum, it didn't get taken care of right away. And what happens when a fossil, like a mammoth fossil that isn't completely mineralized, it rots. <laughs> so when we finally got around to opening up those jackets, it was it was gross, and the bone had exploded, and roots had grown through it, and, and there was mold in it. And unfortunately, we couldn't save the fossil. So sometimes rushing is not that great of an idea. So that makes this skeleton all the more impressive that they were able to do it well. And so speaking of which, we have a question from one of our friends in the UK. Oh, hi. Um, Thanks for tuning in. Wow, that's really cool. Uh, do you know the cause of death? Well, this one's old. It was It was a very old one, and interestingly enough, I like, as I mentioned, there were some, some uh, tools and uh, a small bit of an uh, arrowhead that were located near this but there were no marks on any of the bones to suggest that it had been carved up with tools. And another fascinating part about this story is because of the rapid nature of getting it out, there were, they had like the sheriff and different people around trying to, you know, have some protection while they were trying to dig it out. But they also used lots of volunteers. And at one point in time, the actual tool that was found with this went missing. Oh. And then, so it was not recorded as to exactly where it okay. came from with respect to this. And later on, somebody associated with the dig said, oh yeah, I've got this, this was found with it. But we don't have any problem. But, data. but yeah. there was, it wasn't, it wasn't written down and collected and photographed at the site because it was just somebody there said, oh, this is oh, cool. That's cool. Yeah. And kept it and then brought it back later. Oh, that's a no, no. <laughs> so the likelihood, because there was no actual markings on the bone is that it probably just died of old age and natural causes, but there were possibly possible stories some of lithic some tools lithic there. tools found with it. So. What did the teeth of this individual look like? Do you recall, since you're familiar with the original skeleton? Uh, teeth are teeth are pretty valuable because if you look at how worn the teeth are, that that could be a good indicator of how old your mammoth is. And the other thing, mammoth teeth, they I, get. I can show you. Yeah, they, they, they come from the. Here we go. Let's take a look at mammoth teeth. So we've got two sets of mammoth teeth here. So if you look here, this is a juvenile or a younger mammoth. And you can see that the ridges of the teeth are pretty prominent. And this is a bit of an older mammoth. And you can see the teeth are pretty worn down, right? So what ends up getting these things, I think, in the end, if they make it to old age and don't get hunted by a people or a, an animal, <laughs> um, what happens is often older animals' teeth get so worn that they can no longer process the vegetation that they're used to eating. And usually it's something like malnutrition that ends up getting them because they can no longer process the food properly and they don't get the proper nutrition that they need for this big of an animal. So, so that's, that's, that's a real good indication. So it's kind of like, like horses because horses wear their teeth down right. to the point Right, they exactly. Don't have it's, teeth it's the anymore. Same, same premise. And the downside to being a mammal is we only get one set of replacement teeth. So once our grown up teeth are ground down. We do. Mammoths get six. Well, they have six sets of teeth, but 
they would have three full size molars and then three pre molars or like right. juvenile molars. Right. So they so, would actually cycle through six. So they cycle through more than more than, than just two. The two. Okay. Well, I did not know that. Now we know more about mammoths than than I ever wanted to know. <laughs> I have a great transitional yes. question for okay. you. Um, were there saber tooth tigers in Kansas? Did oh they my. live in the area? Oh um, goodness. And what is their closest living relative? Let's go this way. Oh, hey, we've got the perfect answer. <laughs> Glad that wasn't on uh, film. <laughs> uh, I nearly hung myself. <laughs> so if we come over this way, we can see our saber tooth. And saber tooth cats were found all over North America. So they were in Kansas. There, the play, and then you could find the the skeletons from Florida to California. So they were definitely all over the United States during the Pleistocene. Um, but the greatest number of them have been found in California, because California has the La Brea tar pits, and the tar pits were a place where there was lots of animals that got caught in the tar, and tar is really good at preserving bones. So things that got buried there basically were preserved extremely well. So, so would, would that qualify as a predator trap? It really was because there's, you know, there were prey that are caught in the La Brea tar pits, but there are predators caught there uh, an order of magnitude in greater abundance than you find the prey items. So uh, saber tooth cats and dire wolves were really caught by the hundreds. Right, so what happens is an animal gets caught in this sticky material and can't get out and eventually dies and the predators see an easy meal and they, they follow their noses and they go in there and try to get their meal and then they find themselves stuck and then the cycle just repeats itself over and over and over. So we call that a predator trap because like we said, often you find a greater number of predators then you do what we would consider a traditional prey animal. So, yes, we did have saber tooth that would have been wandering through Kansas. This particular one that we've got here that is complete actually came from the La Brea tar pits because again, you can find very complete animals in La Brea. Um, and looking for closest living relatives, uh, you're probably going to look towards, as we look up, our large cats like our uh, cougar cougar mountain lion puma catamount we got a whole bunch of names for um, for mountain lions or cougars here right. in North America I'm from Washington State so I always think of them as cougars because I'm from Eastern Washington <laughs> and my daughter lives in Vermont so they're catamounts I've never heard that before that's interesting <laughs> um, like, so if you're walking around out in the woods, a cat of mount, might mount you and eat you? Well, it's a mountain cat, so it's a oh, cat of mount. okay, okay. Uh, that sounded better in my head. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, for comparison, we've got, and this is a good use of our zoological collection, because what we're able to do is we're able to actually compare. We've got our taxidermy mount here, and we've got our osteological specimen here of... Um, of a mountain lion or cougar or catamount. Um, and we can compare, let's compare it to the skull. So pretty similar with the exception of those big saber teeth, right? Um, some differences. So, you know, I noticed this structure right here is a little bit more- uh, Prominent. Prominent or enlarged. And what that's all about is actually the muscles would attach to the jaws and run through here and attach to that crest. We call that a sagittal crest. And so that gives you an indication of bite force. So we, we think that saber, saber tooth, saber teeth, cats are, you know, likely had a pretty powerful bite force. And since we're on cats, we can take a look because one of the cool things about the Ice Age in North America 
is we didn't just have saber tooth cats, we also had really large cats. We had North American lions. So here we have. You can tell we've been closed for a week or two now because we were getting cobwebs. So this is a North American lion. And North American lions, uh, they moved around kind of like everything else around from Siberia, uh, across the Bering Strait into Alaska, moved down into North America, and they got a lot bigger. They're huge compared to African lions, which... Grab the skull behind you in comparison so they can see the difference. They basically where it was warm all the time. And the big thing with Ice Age, our, our feature with, is size. Things get bigger when it's colder. Uh, partially because they just want to stay warm. So they have to eat more to, to keep their body temperatures up. So generally, when it's cold, things get big. So if we want to look, we've got a North American lion here. And that's an African lion, right? And that's an Af I mean, sorry, an African lion. So an African lion size, a uh, pretty big animal. And here's a skull of an African lion. So is that individual a male or female? Is it got, a young male? This one's a young male. Okay. Yes. <coughs> and so you can see a pretty normal, average sized skull of an African lion. And it's a pretty big, large cat. It's, lions are our second largest cats in the world today, um, after, after tigers. So it's a pretty large cat. So if you want to compare an African lion to what we actually had over here for our North American lion, you can see, let's go over here. There is a very, very large difference. So our North American lions, and this is all muscle attachment up here, so I definitely don't want to get in this guy's mouth. We're absolutely huge, right? So if you go back to the Pleistocene, uh, the cats were much bigger and much stronger and much scarier than any cats that we have today. Uh, just look at the teeth, the tooth size here. That's, that's that's a huge difference. So uh, the cats were much bigger. Uh, we don't have tigers in North America. We have lions. We do have large saber-toothed cats. We also have bears in North America in the Pleistocene, and they were also really, really large. The bears. The bears. So we have lions and saber tooths and bears, oh my, oh my. not quite tigers, mm -hmm. but we do have scary things. So let's take a look at bears since we're going about different kinds of scary predators. What about that beaver? I think the beaver is scary. We'll come back to that. We'll come back to that because we're already stuck back here where we have our bears. <laughs> and neither one of us are looking forward to trying to climb back over. So here we have examples of bears. We have a small polar bear over here. We have a giant grizzly bear. This is actually a Kodiak bear, which are the largest bears, uh, the non-polar bears. Polar bears are the largest species of bear that we have in the world right now. They're s slightly ahead of Kodiak Island grizzly bears. This was a grizzly bear that was shot in 1964 by Ross Beach. <laughs> and it was a world record at the time. So this is a really giant grizzly bear. And if you look right next to it, we have a skeleton back here of a short-faced bear. And this short-faced bear is just a um, small to medium-sized short-faced bear. He's not really that big. He's an adult, but he's not really huge. So he's pretty small. But if you compare him in size, and that's just a skeleton. We haven't even put flesh on this thing yet. How much larger he is than this giant grizzly bear. So short-faced bears were much bigger. So when we talk lions, tigers, and bears, the bears were absolutely huge in the Ice Age. Uh, and the other scary thing is we know that uh, like grizzly bears will go out and try to eat a lot of salmon and things. These short-faced bears had much longer legs. They actually could run a lot faster. And grizzly bears are pretty fast. I'm not going to be able to run away from them. But these were much faster animals. Uh, longer legs could actually run and, and chase things down. And they were really, really, really um, scared. 
And if you think about it, the predators had to be a lot bigger because the prey animals were a lot bigger. Because what do we have for prey in the Ice Age? We've got mammoths, we've got bison that were really large. Uh, we've got some really large uh, sort of moose elk things. We've got all kinds of uh, really large prey items. Um, so we needed to have some really large predators. Well, speaking of large and maybe not so large, look at the dire wolf over here. Uh, I was shocked because again, I don't know much about ice age mammals. My focus has always been dinosaurs and marine reptiles of the Cretaceous. So when I saw my first dire wolf skeleton, I was a little shocked because, you know, I'm a big dork, so I watch all the nerdy shows and fantasy shows, and you always see dire wolves represented as these big creatures that, I don't know, goblins and trolls ride and, you know, into battle. And really, if you compare it to a gray wolf, it's actually pretty comparable in size. So what's up with that, Reese? Well, it's a fascinating thing. The one thing about dire wolves is if you actually get down to looking at their skeletons, their skeletons are more robust, which means their bones are thicker than a modern wolf is. But as far as their actual size, they're about the same size. One of the funny differences that makes dire wolves much different than modern wolves is they're found um, lots of times in groups of 30 or so. So they, you know, modern wolves are more either loners or in small packs. Um, dire wolves ran around in really large packs. So they could also um, have the strategy of being able to catch and take down really large prey because they ran around in very large packs or groups of up to 30 or so as opposed to small groups of one to seven or eight. So a, a much different strategy for taking down really large prey as the Ice Age was wont to have, really large prey. Well, so, and, and yeah, and another thing that kind of supports what you're saying is like, if you look at the skull, like you said, it is more robust. It is broader and a little bit, a little bit thicker, heavier. And this is the big difference I see between our wolf, our modern gray wolf here and our dire wolf is look at this sagittal crest. Again, this is all about muscle attachment. So you see a, a much more reduced crest here so you know there's there's not as much of a uh, indication of a bite force and we know that that canids or dogs tend to you know be bone processors they don't leave much to waste um, so this just gives you an example of the kind of bone or the size of bones maybe that these animals were processing after they took it down that's kind of cool so we have a question from Curtis Wolf. Hi, Curtis. Oh, we have to say hi to Rachel again. Hi, Rachel. <laughs> hi. Uh, Curtis asks, are the Ice Age children's movies relatively, in quotes, relatively accurate based on what we know about animals during that time? Well, we all know that all mammoths sounded like Ray Romano. Oh, yes. That absolutely. is definitely no. Um, I don't know. Um, I, you know. I don't know enough about Ice Age animals to know whether the animals portrayed in that movie actually existed in the same timeline. I'm pretty sure that Sid the Sloth would not have looked like a modern sloth. No, probably, probably not. Uh, the, the animals that were in the Ice Age movies did pretty well good as far as putting the right ones together at the right time until they got to the dinosaurs and tried to throw the dinosaurs in. Yeah, I think there were some marine reptiles in there too. Yeah, so, so well, until they got there, they were doing Then you got right. aliens in there and I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> but, but as far as the mammoths and the saber-toothed cats, um, they did a pretty good job as far as at least at, at that time getting the right animals together. Yeah, the sloth was not going to be bouncing around. So uh, as with anything with children's stories, there's lots of, uh, exceptions and and uh, stretching the yeah. limits of yeah. credibility yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know you got to care about your character so you can make them talk and make them do funny things um, 
I do recall, it seems like they have like teleoceros type things, which is Ice Age rhinoceros with the strange structures. Oh, I, I don't remember yeah. exactly what kind they have, but That's that was true. that was kind of a thoughtful detail because we do have some of these uh, rhinoceros specimens in our collection. We don't have them on display out here, uh, but I know we've got a couple of different variations of those rhinoceri. Which, which brings it to an interesting point. When we talk about the ice age, what we really should be saying are ice ages. There is a number of different times where the ice came down and covered up large parts of the world in North America. Then the climate would warm up and they would melt all the way back into northern uh, Canada, northern Arctic. And then as the climate would cool again, they would build back down and, and cover up large parts of North America. So we had multiple ice ages uh, over the last two million years. And each ice age might last 100,000 years or so. Um, so during these ice ages, there were a lot of different mammals. And so in the, in the books, a lot of are the, the movies, they would make mixed together animals that were from the ice ages, but were not necessarily at the exact same time. I think there were like glyptodons and all sorts right, of different things right. that were, you know, from even different parts of the world all mixed together, um, where they wouldn't have been mixed together geographically even, but they were at least animals that belonged to the same two million year well, time and, period. And for a long while there, there was no saber tooth rat until fairly recently <laughs> they found a specimen that looks like a scrap. Um, and I'm not sure what age he's from or it's from, and I'm not sure what they decided to name it, but I know that they did find a specimen and everybody was like, hey, look. So it's one of those examples of, of science imitating art. <laughs> so exactly. since you have the bear behind you, um, CJ asks, what is the bigger species, Sarcastodon or the short-faced bear? I think the short-faced bear is the largest uh, the largest bear that we've got and that when you get to the, the largest ones of the short-faced bears there this is I believe is 10 feet tall and I think they could get as much as 12 feet tall so they could get quite a bit bigger than this so you could look into the second story window of the building yeah you're, you're talking this this thing could take out a mammoth then yes <laughs> <laughs> yikes and then we have another question um, I believe you mentioned state fossils earlier. Mm -hmm. um, why does Kansas have better state fossils than Nebraska? Aha! <laughs> that is my opinion. <laughs> that is not fact. Um, because really, mammoths are really cool, but they have three state, state fossils and they're all mammoths. They're all just different mammoths. Whereas, you know, we Kansas, we've got a Cretaceous Mosasaur, so we got this gigantic monstrous swimming uh, reptile, which is really cool. And we also have our second state fossil is a pteranodon. So we've got a giant flying uh, reptile that swooped over the seaways eating fish. So a giant flying thing like you've seen in, in the uh, Jurassic World movies. I mean, you see it in all sorts of movies. You got flying reptiles. Those are pteranodons. That's a state fossil. So you have two really cool and, and very different state fossils. Listen, mammoths are cool, but really. Well, and you know, how many this, states have mammoths as their state fossil? I mean, we've still got elephants around today, which are very similar and pretty cool. But, They're cool animals, there's no doubt. But we don't have any pteranodons or any mosasaurs around today, so. I'm but we don't saying. mean to belittle anybody else's state fossils, even though ours are cooler. I do have a couple more questions about the mammoth. If you okay. Want to go back to that. All right, let's go back to that. But don't watch us climb over there. It'd be embarrassing. <laughs> Two old guys trying to climb over ropes. I'll turn to the mammals. There we We're go. just learning the ropes. Um, so I've I forgotten the ropes. So I got two questions about how many bones are in a mammoth skeleton. Do you know? I don't know if I can tell you that off the top of my head. Oh, goodness gracious. It seems like hundred, what is it? 40? Say it. Go ahead and say 416. it. 416. 416 bones. 416 or more. Okay. So there's more than 400 bones in a man. Thank you. That's a lot of bones.
And some of them are very big. Our wingman over here, Jake, uh, used to work at... The Mammoth site in Mammoth Hot Springs, site. South Dakota. In South Dakota, okay. So he's a little more familiar with mammoths than those of us who deal in Cretaceous marine reptiles. Um, well, did, did you have a, a fully uh, articulated mammoth at Mammoth Hot Springs? Uh, do you mean did we have a skeleton on display or yes. did we have... Yes, we had two skeletons on display. And then in the pit we had two skeletons that were fairly complete. Were the skeletons you had on display from from the site? The ones that were um, put together and standing up like this? No. One of them, neither of them was from our site. I know, where'd they come from? I can see where I you're going. I think one of this. them came from Utah. One of them is this one. Yeah, one of them is this one. <laughs> uh, I know that because I, I saw the sales records of where they sold these 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 uh, skeletons from. So I'm just saying you know this one too. Yes, so I, was, I do. Was that one more question? Uh, yes, uh, we do have another question about mammoths. Okay. And um, that is, what is the difference between a Colombian, a woolly, and an imperial mammoth? Man, what is the difference between a Colombian imperial and a woolly mammoth, Jake? Uh, the biggest difference is going to be size. Uh, imperial mammoths are a little bit bigger than the Colombians, which are bigger than the woolies. Uh, of course, the woolly mammoth is known for having that thick coat of hair, uh, while neither the Imperial or the Colombian had that hair. Uh, at least not as coarse. They think it would have been probably similar to like modern elephants, where they would have had some hair, but not a lot like a fur coat. There we go. There we go. There are also differences in the teeth that you can see, but it's better to actually have the teeth in front of you so you can see the differences. As with most mammals, really, when you're looking for differences, you always look at the teeth. Yeah, pretty much. Teeth change depending on what you're eating. Even if you're a plant eater, the kind of vegetation that you're eating probably needs a special kind of tooth to eat it, so. Which is one of the simple ways that we always tell mastodons from mammoths, right? Right, right. these mastodons are eating something that was a little pulpier or something. Yeah, they're eating more leaves and branches off of trees, whereas mammoths are mostly eating grasses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and some uh, Candy wants to know, what are we talking about at two o'clock? I can't remember. I looked at it for 15, 20 minutes ago. Uh, what did we decide we're talking about? Does anybody remember. remember? I can't remember. It'll be a surprise. My it's a surprise. My brain melted so much over the last couple of weeks that I can't remember what I was doing five minutes ago. I'm sorry, Candy. Oh, here's a good question. Did the Colombian mammoth breed with the woolly mammoth? Ooh, that's a, actually a really kind of a cool question. Uh, and one of the things that, that's fun uh, when we look at, at uh, this mammoth, I'll tell you some stories, is I know that mammoths came across from Asia into North America, across the Bering Strait. So they came in, coming from Russia into Canada, Alaska, and then spread down around all of North America. After a certain amount of time, a lot of those mammoths went back across into Asia. So there were migrations back and forth between Asia and North America of mammoths. And uh, the cool thing again, because these mammoth bones, a lot of them are, are very young, is there's lots of collagen and, and soft tissue that were still preserved in them. So a lot of times, there was the ability to get DNA from them. So there have been studies, genetic studies, and they did show a lot of connection between back and forth of mammoths. So there has been quite a few studies on the genetic relatedness of different mammoth species. And I don't remember specifically if Colombian and Imperial mammoths reproduced, Columbian and woolly. or Colombian and woolly mammoths uh, interbred, but I think it is a very, decent possibility because they were migrating back and forth and so there was going to be some interbreeding of populations. Uh, so I have to look up the genetic studies that have been done, but I would not be surprised if there weren't some, the ability for some of these uh, species to have interbred. Okay. Um, so just to go back to our previous question, what are we doing later this afternoon? We'll be back with Curtis 
and we may be talking about birds, but it's really up to him what he would like to talk about. So um, that's kind of why I was not sure, is because I left it up to him. So we'll, it'll be kind of a surprise, but we'll be with Curtis, which is always fun, I think. We have two questions from Gabe. Um, Hi, Gabe. Uh, what period did mammoths exist? So what period were they alive? Pleistocene. Pleistocene. And how long is a mammoth's lifespan? Ha! Ah, mammoth, mammoth lifespans. One of the interesting things with mammoths are when you look at their, their tusks, which are made out of ivory, uh, is they have growth lines in them. So you can actually slice open a, a, a tusk of a mammoth and you can see even daily growth lines. So you can, you can actually look at the age of mammoths through their tusks. Um, and there's been lots of work on that. And I, a lot of mammoths uh, would live to be 40 to 50 years old at least, but they could live at least, to, or they could live to 100? 60. 60 yeah. to 70. 60 to 70. I, I would have said 70. Yeah, Jake, I thought you were kind of doing Wakanda forever. Uh, but I was, was, was going to say 70 to 80 for the for the maximum lifespan, and a lot of them would be 40, you'd, you'd 40 to 50. Be a terrible base coach. Like I would know which way I was running. So anyway, yes, this particular animal is probably in that 40 to 50 year range. Uh, the teeth suggested it wasn't about to die, so it wasn't quite into the 70 range. Here's a good question for you, Ian, since you mentioned it earlier. CJ asks. Is that a huge beaver behind you? <laughs> that is a ginormous, I love that word, beaver behind us. So everything was big apparently in the ice age, except for dire wolf, which was more robust. So that makes him technically bigger, I guess. But this is a beaver. And you can see compared to our modern North American beaver, the giant beaver is in fact giant. So, Reese, do you think this beaver got this giant because temperature? Or do you think it was just eating giant trees and had to be giant because of that? Or making giant dams and giant glacial ponds? Or what was it doing, man? Well, the interesting thing is beavers have been around a long time. And it's really only been in the last uh, short amount of time a, where these giant beavers are when they actually started really chewing wood and building big dams. Not all beavers throughout history built dams. Um, but these giant beavers, uh, you can even see the wear marks on their teeth here. Uh, those teeth kept growing and so there was a lot of wear on their teeth. So they did get really large, but a lot of it still is it was a lot colder. I mean, beavers today live up where it's awfully cold. Um, so there is, but just in general, things got bigger in the ice age for a number of reasons. One of them is that it was quite a bit colder. And I think you can find the little skull up there, potentially. Mm -hmm. Potentially, I have found that skull. <laughs> <laughs> and you can compare directly how giant this beaver is. I can figure out how to get the skull back. There we go. Something kind of like that, is that? Yep. Okay. And there you can see the size of the beaver change. And this was uh, a, uh, a different, slightly different beaver, but again, much, much larger than what we have uh, today. And so ice age, cold, cold makes big. So they haven't found evidence of lodges or dams built by the giant beaver so they're extrapolating basically from the the shape and size of the teeth and comparing it to what our extant or modern beavers are doing so that's uh, i think that's still out uh to exactly. be supported you know, exactly we're, we're always looking for evidence to support our hypothesis. So right now, the hypothesis uh, about the giant beaver is that they did, in fact, build large lodges and dams in, in freshwater ponds. That would have been probably quite prevalent in 
that time, uh, given the source of water, one of the things was plentiful. What's really fascinating too about the Ice Age is that in a lot of parts of the northern part of, of North America, is we had a lot of animals die and were essentially buried in permafrost or uh, permanently frozen frosted uh, soils and then would get buried. And now with uh, global warming that's happening around the world, a lot of these areas with permafrost are melting. And so we're finding more and more and more animals that died in the ice age that are being found with their soft parts and everything intact from Siberia to Alaska. And one of the things that happens as we melt the permafrost, A, we get a much better idea of the animals, but there's the potential that we'll find things like if there were dams built by giant beavers, there's a greater chance we're gonna find them because we're finding more and more exposed areas that have these animals that had been buried. How, uh, how cool would it be to find a beaver lodge with beavers in it? Wouldn't that be neat? That would be really awesome. Yeah, I, so, I would love that. You know, there's hope. There's things to be found. All right. So do we have any more questions before we sign off for our morning live cast? Uh, yes. Um, somebody wanted to know, when will you be talking about amphibians again? And when will you be talking about lizards? Um, hang on. Let me pull up my schedule. I think I just had it up. Let me see if I can find it. <laughs> All right. Uh, Oh, we're, we're talking about monitors to Mosasaurus coming up. Uh, let's see here. We're doing dogs and canids tomorrow, non-venomous snakes on Thursday. Uh, we may do something on Thursday afternoon. That's an open slot right now. Um, and then, yes, Friday we're doing monitors and mosasaurs so we will be getting a little bit of reptile uh, or amphibious reptile i guess technically i mean water reptiles amphibious i, I guess it, that's not that's aquatic a word semi-aquatic reptiles there, there you go <laughs> Words, they're hard today and we do have one last question okay. about mammoths um or actually just mammals in general um did these mammals grow more slowly due to the colder temperatures no actually they didn't um, most of these animals still grew very rapidly uh, it's actually one of the interesting things a lot of times the the uh, almost the worst the least nutritive food the bigger the animals get and the more they eat so they just eat up an awful lot uh, but if you look at the growth rates they're, they actually grow almost even more rapidly because they have to get to a larger sizes to be able to you know, help maintain their body temperature. So no, mammals still grow at similar or just as or faster rates than mammals that live where it's really warm. Okay. That's, uh, All right. that's, well, last that's it. For We're now. going to sign off for the morning. We'll be back this afternoon with Curtis talking about birds or something he's currently live right now watching actually hi curtis, hey, curtis are we going to talk about birds or are we going to talk about something else <laughs> <laughs> quick answer me now <laughs> um we'll, we'll figure it out but I, i'm pretty sure we're gonna it'll be fine because curtis is always fun to work with um so uh as always please like us please like us and mm -hmm. share our pages and let people know we're doing this because if people don't watch we don't have anything to do Curtis says, yes, you will be talking about birds. Yes, we will ta be talking about birds directly from Mr. Curtis J. Smith's mouth, our zoological <laughs> collections manager. Thank you, Curtis. I'll see you this afternoon. Not aliens. Not aliens. It's not aliens. <laughs> <laughs>